Hey, this is Dino, another Apogee Tech Talk. Today I want to talk to you about JWT Bearer Token Exchange. This is a way that a client may request an access token from Apogee. The original IETF RFC that described OAuth 2.0, um, RFC 6749, described one grant type, uh, a, a grant type for client credentials. Um, which required that the client send in its credentials in the authorization header encoded um, as a base 64 uh, encoded blob. And along with that, a, a form, um, which is indicated by this content type, with exactly one parameter, grant type equals um, client credentials. So send in your um, client ID and secret encoded in that way to the token dispensing endpoint um, with that form and you get an access token in response. Um, that works, lots of different people are depending on that. There's a different IETF RFC that describes a different way to get a token um, and that is 7523. It describes the JWT bearer approach where the client does not send a client ID and secret in the header. It's still a post, still a, a form. Uh, there are two parameters in this case, grant type, and it's this string indicating JWT bearer. And the second parameter is assertion, which is a signed JWT that the client produces. And that JWT ought to have this kind of structure in its payload. It is then signed with a private key that belongs to that client. According to this standard, the token dispensing endpoint should verify that signature and then return uh, an access token. So that's all just background. Um, actually, this style of token exchange, the JWT bearer uh, grant, is used by Google for service to service invocation for any of the cloud APIs, including cloud logging or Vertex AI, BigQuery, cloud, Apigee, and so on. Um, and the example that I put together here shows how you can implement this flow within your Apigee APIs to allow client apps to authenticate via this approach. Why would you do this? Why would you want to do this? Why not just use client credentials? Well, um, it's bottom line, it's more secure. Uh, client credentials grant requires that you send in a secret. The client must send a secret to the server with every request for a token. And that's sending secrets over the network is something that security experts will frown on. Uh, with the JWT bearer approach, the client does not transmit secrets. It's a digital signature, which is not a secret, uh, but it does offer proof that the signer possesses the private key. Uh, you might also ask, well, why exchange a JWT for an opaque token then? Why not just use the JWT as the access token? Well, the reason to, to perform a token exchange is for performance. Uh, JWT are large and computationally expensive to parse and verify. Um, on the other hand, an OAuth token is smaller and faster. So um, that's why you'd want to do the token exchange. Superior security is probably why Google uses this pattern for all its APIs and performance is just a bonus. Okay, so I'm going to walk through um, producing an API proxy and demonstrating how this is going to work using this repo. And you can follow along. The prerequisites are that you need Apigee X. Um, I haven't tried this on any other version of Apigee. The helper scripts that I'll use depend on various Unix utilities. So you need a, a Unix to do this. It's not going to work from Windows. But take heart, you can use Google Cloud Shell, which is available to you if you have Apigee X. So even if you have Windows on your developer workstation, you can still do this. So how does it work? There's a, um, a proxy in here that dispenses tokens. The base path on that is JWT bear OAuth, and it just accepts uh, an inbound request um, of the form described in RFC 7523, um, just as I've described. Um, there are some requirements on that JWT. Uh, the Apigee proxy checks for all those things, and if it looks good, um, the Apigee proxy will dispense an access token which looks and works like any other access. It's just an opaque access token. 
as with any OAuth flow in Apigee, in order to support that, you, there must be a developer entity, an API product, and an app registered for the developer that is authorized on that API product. I mean, there's a lot of setup that you got to do. Um, but the good news is I have a, um, a some helper scripts that will help you through all that. The one twist in this, the registered app must have a custom attribute on it called public key, and its contents must be the the public key, the thing that starts with begin public key and ends with end public key. Um, and Apogee is going to use that public key to verify the inbound signed JWT from the client. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as I say, there are some helper scripts uh, along with its instructions. Uh, I'm going to follow along using the Google Cloud shell. If you have a console open to Google Cloud, you can just click this icon to open Google Cloud shell right in your browser. Or if you're, you're comfortable doing it from the terminal, you can also get there. And if you have the G Cloud um, utility installed locally, you can get to your Cloud shell just with this command. So let's do that get started here okay um, there's my shell running in Google Cloud once that's uh, open we're gonna clone this repo um, that takes just a moment then I need to log in and it's gonna tell me hey are you sure I don't think you need to log in, in my experience yes you do so to do that it's gonna give you this long URL you gotta grab that paste it into your address bar in a browser and authenticate. Uh, at the end of that, you will get an authorization code, which you paste in. OK, returning to the instructions, we've now logged in. Uh, let's change to the directory that we uh, cloned the repo in. Uh, and then we need to modify the environment. Um, I'm going to use VI for that purpose. And basically, this is just setting some environment variables for um, my Apigee project, environment, and host. OK, that all looks good. So let's write that and quit. Then we need to source that file. Terrific. So we've done that step. Uh, now we need to install some dependencies. That'll just take a moment. And after that, we're going to set up the proxies, developer, the product, and the app. This will take a few minutes. OK. So we get the happy message that says all the Apogee artifacts are successfully set up. Um, and we should copy that client ID and set it in the shell. Uh, OK, so we've done that. Now, um, so it's got the app and the developer and the API product. Uh, but we haven't set up the RSA key pair. So let's first produce a key pair. Um, and the script stores the text encoding for the public and private key in the keys subdirectory. You know, it, it's the thing that looks like this. Now what we want to do is associate that public key to the app as a custom attribute. And uh, again, we've got a, a helper script that, to do this. You can do all of this stuff by pointing and clicking in the administrative user interface for Apigee. Uh, but it's easier to kind of automate it um, with with these scripts. And so now um, we've updated that app with the um, public key. And the next step says, hey, why don't you navigate to the Apigee UI and examine what you've got uh, configured there. So let's do that. Um, we'll look in the, um, the app. And this is the app that we've just created. There's the client ID in secret, normal. This is the, the set of custom attributes, and those are all set in, um, set by that, uh, by that script. And if you look at this, you can see this is that 
thing that looks like a PEM encoded public key, just all in one, one line there. So that's, that's going to be the, um, the thing that Apogee uses to verify the signature on the inbound assertion. The app is associated to a single product. That product wraps an API proxy. You know, all that is you know, standard um, Apogee stuff. All right, so we've done that. Now what we want to do is use the helper script to create a new signed JWT. This is the assertion. Um, and we'll run that again from our Cloud Shell terminal. The result is this JWT, which we want to grab that and just set a shell variable. Um, that is the assertion. So uh, what's in there? Uh, actually, the output of this command will show uh, what the header looks like and what the payload looks like. So I hope you can make this out. There's the issuer. That issuer is the client ID. That's this. And that is a requirement for this token exchange. Uh, the subject is the same value. The audience is the endpoint that uh, the client will send the assertion to in order to request a token. And then it's got an issued at time and an expiry. So nothing really exotic there. Um, so we've got that. And at this point, we can use that self-signed JWT as the credential to request a token. So let's grab that command um, and we'll send that in. And sure enough, I get an access token back from the, um, from the token dispensing proxy. So what just happened there? Um, let, us, uh, let us try that again. Uh, but first, let's turn on trace for the token dispensing proxy. And that is going to be this one. So we'll start a debug session. And um, I'm going to need a new JWT, so let's create another one. Those are single use only. Create another one. Uh, and then request another access token. So I've got the access token. Uh, let's see the transaction. There it is. Um, so we can see all of what um, the API proxy does. But this is maybe a, an interesting part. Um, the the um, well, let's let's kind of step through this. First thing that's maybe interesting is the decoding the JWT. And the reason for that is we need to extract from the JWT the, um, the issuer, which is the client ID. Why do we need that? Uh, we need that in order to retrieve the public key that we'll use to verify the signed assertion. So just decoding the JWT doesn't assure us that that JWT is bona fide. Uh, we're just trying to get the information out that, that allows us to verify it, and that is uh, pulling the issuer. Once we have the issuer, we can access that app using the access entity policy and retrieve the public key that we'll use uh, later to verify the, the assertion that comes in. Um, so it's, it's using the extracted public key from that um, by custom attribute in order to verify the JWT. That works, and uh, the JWT is uh, not expired. It has the appropriate claims, and therefore, you know, we're, we're going to trust it. Subsequent to that, um, we call the Apogee, the standard Apogee OAuth v2 policy to generate an access token uh, and send that back. So that's kind of how it works. And you can see all the, the structure of that uh, in the um, in the proxy configuration, uh, all the checks and, and you know all, all the other logic that goes into that. Uh, there is some flourishes. For example, the JWT gets cached. 
so that it can cannot be used again. If I were to try to use that same JWT again, um, the proxy will reject it because it's been previously used. Uh, so, and that is by design. We, we want that to happen. These, these things should be single use only. So pretty cool. Uh, and you know, if you have any doubts, uh, it's just a regular access token. So if I go back to my shell, this is the actual access token that we had from the successful request. So let's grab that value and we can test it um, just by running um, this command, uh, invoking a particular API proxy with the granted access token. And sure enough, it works. So standard OAuth stuff. There's lots of other experiments that you can conduct. Um, for example, you can, or things that you can explore. For example, you can um, paste in your, your JWT that is used as the, um, the client's identity assertion into a decoder like or a tool like this. So I can paste that in and I can see, maybe it's easier to see this way um, the algorithm it has to be a JWT. The issuer and the subject are the same. That's the client ID. And um, the audience must be uh, this value, which is the, the token dispensing endpoint. Um, so that, that may be interesting. Uh, it, it may also be interesting to generate different JWT. Um, from from that um, from the the helper script. Uh, so, for example, you could uh, create JWT that had the wrong audience, and if you do that, you would expect that the request for token will fail. Uh, or create a JWT that has a lifespan greater than the maximum of three hundred seconds. Um, Again, it should fail. Omit the issued at time, the request for token should fail, and so on. You can try all these, um, or try with a JWT that's expired. One way to do that would be create a JWT with a really short lifespan, and then wait until it expires. Let's just try that one. Um, so we'll, we'll create a new JWT. This is this is the one with the five second life, lifespan. We'll just wait a few seconds. And then again, we wanna make a request for an access token with that JWT. So that'll be the command we run. And it should tell us, hey, um, your, your token, your ID token has expired. So all according to um, expectations, that's what we want. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Um, listen, if, you, if you've if you gone through this and you wanna clean up afterwards, you should be able to just um, run a, the other helper script, the cleanup helper script that removes everything, you know, the app, the product, the developer, the proxies, uh, all that stuff gets cleaned up and, um, you know, returns your, your system to how it was before. Um, I hope this has been helpful and instructive uh, let me know in the comments for this video uh, what you think. Till next time, keep it digital.